Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name's Kevin, I'm an alcoholic, and I'm uh, grateful to be up here tonight with y'all. And at the same time, I'm glad it's the only time I'm going to be up here for the weekend. And uh, not just because I'm nervous, but this is the only suit I have. <laughs> so if I was up here again, I'd have to wear it again. Um, you know, and, and I'd always get nervous before I speak. And, and, uh, and, and so one of the things that I do is I think, well, how bad could it possibly be, you know? And I think about, like, the two times it got the, the worst it possibly could, and both times I got heckled while I was speaking of. But one time was at Venture State Prison in Alabama when one of the inmates yelled out and called me a nerd. And then the other time was in Ashford, Alabama, when right in the middle of my story, one of the guys sitting out there yells out, Did you ever wake up with an ugly woman? <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> and I didn't quite know how to handle either one. Um, so I just went on. Uh, but... You know, I'm, I'm not that good of a speaker, and I, and I like to tell the story, cause, and I have evidence of that, because l- like Bill said, I moved up here from Dothan, Alabama, southeastern Alabama. And uh, while I was down there, um, I, I was going out to a meeting in Donaldsonville, Georgia. I don't know if you all are familiar with the Seminole Group in southwest Georgia, but I was going out there, and uh, on the way, there was about four of us in the car. And on the way, we passed by some people who we knew uh, from Dothan, and we was about 20 minutes outside of town driving time. So, you know, walking, they was walking down the road. And uh, and one of the people in the car said, wasn't that, I can't remember her name, Cindy or whatever. And uh, so I said, I don't know, was it? Let's turn around. So we turned around and went back, and, and we stopped there. And it was a hot day. It was the middle of August in Dothan, Alabama. And you know how hot it gets down there. And uh, we turned back around and rolled down the window, and it was and she was just walking back towards Dothan. It must have been, you know, 10, 15 miles out of town. And uh, we stopped and said, hey, uh, what's happening? She said, well, my car broke down, and I couldn't get in touch with anybody back in Dothan, so I'm just walking back into town. And uh, and and I said, well, I'm on my way to Donaldsonville, and I got to go out there and speak. So we can't take you back right now. But if you, you go, go out there and h- hear me speak, and we'll take you back. She paused for a second. She goes, no, I'll just walk. <laughs> <laughs> so I, and she had heard me before too. <laughs> um. One of the things I like to do, since I do get nervous, is just tell a little joke, and, and it has something to do with that. It's just a funny joke that has something to do with drinking. Uh, this guy comes home late at night, and he's been drinking all night, and he doesn't want his wife to know that he's drunk. So he, uh, while it's a two-story house, and while he's downstairs, he, he walks in the laundry room and just takes off all his clothes and just sneaks up the stairs real quiet and uh, sneaks in the bed with her. She doesn't wake up, and he's like, man, I got away with it. Everything's cool. So he just goes to sleep. Well, the wife wakes up early in the morning the next morning. And uh, she goes downstairs and she starts washing clothes. Well, you know, a minute later she walks back up the stairs and wakes him up. And, uh, you know, he's half drunk. And she says, honey? He says, yeah. She says, uh, what happened last night? There's uh, vomit all over your shirt. And, uh, you know, even though he's half drunk, he thinks real quick for a second. He goes, well, I'll tell you, I was out on a business function last night. And one of the guys that was with me just got way out of control and got real drunk and just, you know, got physically sick and threw up all over me. And it was just so embarrassing. I just came on home. I was so disgusted with the whole thing. And she believes it. She buys it. She goes, okay. And she goes back downstairs to wash clothes. Well, only a minute goes by and she's back upstairs again. And she wakes him back up. And she says, honey? He says, yeah. She goes, you know the guy that uh, threw up on your shirt? And he says, yeah. She goes, well, he peed in your pants, too. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I'm supposed to tell you in a general way what it was like and what happened and what it's like now. And so that's what I'm up here to do. Um, and I'm just going to kind of start at the beginning. I was born in North Carolina, born in Charlotte, and I lived there for about a year. And my family moved up to Virginia, near the Richmond area, and we lived up there for about eight years. And in 1981... Uh, I was born in 1972, and in 1981, we moved back to North Carolina, uh, about 45 minutes northwest of Charlotte, in a little place called Cheryl's Ford, North Carolina, way out in the middle of the country. We had a little community neighborhood out there. Uh, my grandma lived right down the road, my aunt and cousin, everybody lived all right around us, um, just way out in the middle of nothing. And, uh, and, and that was 1981, and then, you know, I guess about, I started drinking when I was 15 years old. 
And it's funny that after I got into AA, I started thinking back on, you know, what made me an alcoholic. I don't have any family uh, history of alcoholism. I got maybe one cousin, and that's like my mom's nephew. He lives way up in Canada. But besides that, I I don't have uh, any history of alcoholism in my family. My parents, I never saw them drink. My grandparents, I never saw them drink either. So, you know, I was trying to figure out after I came into AA uh, what it was that, made me an alcoholic and uh and about six months sober i decided that i was born an alcoholic for for whatever reason you know i was born an alcoholic with this strange mental uh twist and all and my neighbor uh when i got sober he asked me you know what was it that made you drink so much how can you drink so much and i started telling him, well eric i was born an alcoholic and i can tell you why because when i was about 12 or 13 years old i just you know i just started feeling different than everybody else you know, my clothes didn't fit me right. I wasn't popular enough with the girls and all, and I wasn't athletic enough, and I wasn't cool enough, and everything was just, I just felt different than everybody else, and I never really fit in, so I know I was born an alcoholic. And Eric said, uh, yeah, I went through that too. It's called puberty. <laughs> 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 but anyways, I mean, that's, I, I, I don't know, looking, who knows? Who knows what it, why it was that I started drinking so much the way I did, but when I was 15 years old, I, I took my first real drink, and, uh, and I got way out of control. I got really, really drunk. And, uh, and, and, and made a fool out of myself. You know, I, I was 15 the first time I drank, so I, I passed out, threw up everywhere, and, you know, said, told all, run around to all the girls, tell them I loved them and all that stuff, you know, just like a, a 15 year old drunk would do. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, you know, I woke up the next morning feeling terrible and just, oh, and all of a sudden, you know, all my friends were up telling me, ha ha, you know what you did last night, all the stupid things you said and all the stupid things you did, you know, and I just felt so embarrassed about everything. But, you know, I don't really remember at that time thinking to myself, well, shoot, this drinking thing ain't for me. I ain't going to do this no more. I thought to myself, probably like a lot of y'all did, well, I'm going to do that again, but next time I'm going to do it right. <laughs> <laughs> Because, you know, I, it's, it's what I told myself. Well, when I first started, you know, after I had those first couple of beers, it wasn't like that. I wasn't making a fool out of myself. I was having a good time, and then I was feeling really good, and everything was going fine. So if I just control the amount that I drink, um, everything should be okay. Um, but that first night, I've heard a lot of people talk about, and I don't know nothing about medicine and psychology and all that stuff, but I have heard some people say, whether it's true or not, that if you start drinking that way, that sometimes it kind of sets off some sort of trigger, and you drink like that for the rest of your life. And, And that's the way my drinking was never normal in any sense of the word. Pretty much from the time I was 15, every time I drank, I I got, you know, more or less that drunk and uh, always rarely failed to make a fool out of myself in one way or another. (laughs) Um, But, of course, the first couple of years, 15 and 16 years old, I couldn't really get my hands on liquor that that easily. Uh, And I really started drinking heavily when I was about 17. But one thing I did start doing when I was 16 years old was doing a lot of drag racing. Out there in the middle of the country, wasn't anything to do at night. We used to go down to this local pizza restaurant called Untouchables Pizza in Denver, North Carolina, the corner of Highway 150 and Highway 16. Um, and uh, <laughs> I don't know why I said that. <laughs> <laughs> like everybody's going to go, oh, yeah. That, that, that. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> But that's where everybody hang out from Bandy's High School. Everybody go down there and hang out in that parking lot. And, and a lot of my friends had some fast cars, Buick Grand Nationals and IROC Camaros and things like Well, I, I had a, uh, at that time, I had a little just Escort GT Turbo or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> But Dad, now Dad worked for Ford Motor Company, and Dad, he'd bring home all these Thunderbird Turbo Coupes and Mustang GTs and all this stuff that would really fly. And so I went out and had a lot of fun doing that. And um. And, and really, I got myself in trouble a little bit. Uh, not, I never got caught drag racing. Well, I kind of did, but I talked my way out of it. I went, well, no, twice. <laughs> and one time I didn't talk my way out of it, but I'll get back to that. Um, but I, I got a few speeding tickets and one for, like, spinning my tires and just, you know, acting stupid. And, uh, and they took my license for 30 days when I was 17 years old and my insurance went way up. And, you know, Dad had all the lectures with me. And, you know, I, the last thing I want to do is blame Dad for any of my problems. But I loved the relationship me and him had. You know, he'd get on me and tell me that I did the wrong thing. And I'd say, yeah, I'm sorry. And then he'd just, you know, buy me a nice car or something like that and just <laughs> give, me some, give me a bunch of money to go out with and things like that and so I really took advantage of that as much as I possibly could <laughs> and my brother still kind of have resentments about that towards me because my older brother when he was coming along my parents were real strict on him and he did fine and so after he did fine they let me do whatever and I screwed everything up and they wouldn't let my little brother do nothing after that <laughs> so 
I ruined everything. I was I was really a school. Now we weren't rich people by any means. We was a uh, we was middle class and maybe even upper middle class. But we weren't rich. I never remember having a whole lot of nice stuff. But uh, I don't know. I was just I was spoiled. I, I pretty much always got whatever I wanted. I can't really explain that. Maybe I got a good sad face or something. Um, <laughs> but that's what I would do. I would take advantage of uh, dad whenever I got the chance. And when I was seventeen, before I uh, went off to college. That summer was when I really started drinking heavily. Um, I, I would just drink about a 12-pack a night, and I don't really remember a whole lot of nights that I didn't do that. And I had some friends starting to get concerned about me and all, and I even had one friend call a nurse friend of his and ask her, you know, about my drinking and about how much I weighed. I was, you know, I'm six foot one, but at that time I weighed about 150 pounds, and, um, and she told him, you know, that if I kept drinking a 12-pack a night, I'd be dead in three years or whatever. But that was almost a compliment, you know. I was trying to be Mr. Wild Man Crazy Guy, and I... And, and so that was almost a good thing. You know, hey, I'm drinking so much that I'm going to die in a few years. <laughs> and, I, and I don't know why I was trying to be Mr. Crazy Guy. I think I really was kind of a nerd growing up. I always made good grades and I always, you know, followed the rules through elementary school to middle school and everything like that. But I don't know, just all of a sudden that life didn't appeal to me anymore. And I wanted to be like that wild crowd and do those wild things. And, and in some ways, that's kind of what I set out to do. And uh, in some kind of backwards way, I accomplished that. And looking back on it, you know, it's, it was just a big mess is what it was. But uh, I went off to school when I was 17, went to Appalachian State University in Boone, North Carolina. And, uh, and that's kind of known as a party school, and that's really what I did when I got up there. What I would do was I had a pretty cool plan worked out. I figured out pretty early that what you could do is you could sign up for 18 hours, which was the maximum you could take um, without getting special permission from the dean. And then after you figured out which two classes were the hardest, you could drop them and stay with 12 hours and take the minimum, you know, and just stay up there and get drunk all the time. And, and that's what I did. Uh, I went up there with a scholarship of $500 a month, I mean $500 a semester, and uh, with the condition that I kept a B average in the first semester, I had like a C minus and lost that um, scholarship. And then the second semester, I was up there out of four classes, I had a C, a D, and two Fs, and, um, you know, it, it, I was just uh, out of control, and I wasn't going to class. I was trying to schedule my classes around drinking, like going, you know, starting late on Monday and ending early on Thursday so I could start drinking. But, I mean, that doesn't help any because you just drink till late Sunday night and you don't even want to go Monday afternoon. And then, you know, you always think you can get started earlier and earlier on whatever. I just skipped all my classes and flunked just about everything. And um, one of the classes I failed, by the way, was the history of rock music. They, they, uh, <laughs> they, uh, they had offered this. It was an experimental class. They were going to offer it, and if enough people took it and showed enough interest in it, they were going to offer it again. And, you know, I thought I was going to go in there and listen to Led Zeppelin for a semester, and they were playing all this 20s jazz and stuff, and I never really got interested in it, and I flunked it. Um, <laughs> and I kind of want to go back and, and talk about also just about my, um, uh, I guess no better way to call it than my irresponsibility, absolute irresponsibility. I had a job right when I turned 16, but I... I was just lazy on it, and I didn't do anything. And, you know, my, I was like an assistant maintenance man at a retirement home, and uh, he'd send me off to do something. And I'd take three times as long as I normally should doing it and just slack off and not do anything. And I didn't have a job again until I was 19 years old. And, and you know, and, and I still was able to get by barely with, like, Dad's help. You know, Dad needs some money to do this and do that, and I'm too busy, you know, to work. I can't work. I'm too busy in school in the meantime making Fs and all. Um, <laughs> Um, so, you know, my life, the best way I can describe it is it's like a, it's almost like an endless series of boring nights of just like, you know, getting a, a fifth of Evan Williams liquor and sitting by the loudspeaker in my apartment complex and getting drunk and feeling sorry for myself and hating everybody, you know, and I hated everybody too. I mean, it didn't matter who you were because and I think by that time I was just like jealous of other people because my life had just kind of turned so bad so quickly too. At the age of 14 and 15, I had everything going for me, and then all of a sudden, I'm almost flunking out of school, and I'm drunk all the time and losing the faith of my parents and my family. Um, and when I was 19 years old, I had an opportunity to get a job, and uh, my friend Jason told me he could get, us, get me a job down at the Randex Vinyl Siding Factory, and that was cool because they were going to pay me $7.90 an hour which was a lot of money at that time, and I mean, still, it's decent money to me, and, uh, and, and, uh, and every other week, get like eight hours of overtime, and I had to pass a drug test, so I, like, cleaned that up right quick, you know, and, 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 and 30 days, drank some stuff, so daily detox and all. I, I don't want to talk a lot about drugs and stuff that, I, you know, I, I did a bunch of them, um, 
but I got that job. I got that job, and all of a sudden, and, but uh, I had some money in my pocket, and everything was going good. And, uh, you know, I had a car, I had a pretty nice car, and I was able to, like, get some dates with some girls, and I kind of turned things around, you know. And all of a sudden, uh, I was just like, hey, I'm on top of the world. And, and I worked at that job for three months. And then I went back to school in the fall, and I went back to school with, like, 1200 bucks or something in my pocket, and I blew it in 30 days. I had nothing. And that wasn't even paying my own bills. I mean, Dad was paying all my bills. I mean, I, just, I literally blew it on drinking and doing a lot of drugs. I, um, and I, I really can't even say what happened to it. It was just gone. Um, and, and <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, actually, I can say what happened to that, <laughs> but in a general way, I can't give you the list. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and, and I want to say also that amongst all that drinking, I never did stop drag racing. I was just drag racing drunk all the time out in the middle of the country. And I'm really lucky that I never did kill anybody. I, I, I came cl- very close a couple times. I never even really hurt anybody. But one time I was, um, we were, it was uh, New Year's Eve. And we were, um, I was driving my dad's Taurus SHO, which is like a real fast Taurus. And, um, and we were going to Newton, North Carolina for some kind of New Year's Eve party. And I was racing a guy in a Monte Carlo SS behind me. Me and a buddy of mine was in my car, and there was about three of them in that car. And we was going down the highway, and it was like 10 o'clock at night, and out in the middle of the country at this one intersection, they had this stoplight, and there was a, 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 car, a truck pulling a car behind it. And that light turned red, and when that light turned red, I went to pass that truck through the intersection. But what I should have realized was, out in the middle of the country like that, the only reason this light turns red is because there's somebody coming through it the other way. <laughs> and I didn't think about that, but that truck had kind of hidden this car that was sitting there. And so I went through the light when he was coming through the light, and I, uh, I was accelerating through the light, too. Who knows how fast I was going. But I, I, I turned the wheel real sharp and uh, hit right behind his uh, driver's side door, so I didn't hurt him or kill him. And his, his wife was in the car, too. But I completely uh, uh, totaled their car and did like $7,000 damage to my dad's car. And my buddy Chris was with me. And now um, I, we had airbags in that car. And Chris and me, I think, both pretty much did the same thing. We bounced off the airbags and hit our head on the window. And Chris cut his head just a little bit on the window. you know. But when you cut your head even just a little bit, it bleeds a whole lot. So Chris, when we stopped the car, I, I'm sorry the story's taking so long, but he... Um, we had the idea that if the cops come after you get in a wreck when you've been drinking, that the cops look on it better if you're by yourself because it doesn't look like you're out partying. It looks like maybe you just accidentally had a, a one or two extra. I don't know where that philosophy came from. <laughs> <laughs> but we both believed it. We both thought it was true. And we also we also thought it was true, and I, I, I never did figure this one out, that if you go to do the breathalyzer, you put a pity in your mouth, you pass it. I don't know if that was true or not. But um, anyways, Chris wants me wanted to look like I'm by myself in the car, and he's and not realizing he's got blood coming down his face. He gets out of the car, walks about 15 feet, and turns back around, coming towards us, going, "What happened here? Is everybody okay?" <laughs> so, uh, so, and luckily everybody was okay. Dad came down to the, to the scene of the accident, and he got all mad at me, and, um, and they had to get the car fixed. And, and they gave me a, uh, he didn't even give me a DUI that night. He gave me a reckless driving, and, and my dad knew a lawyer and got me completely out of it. Got the car fixed, got it back, and the day he got it back, I got drunk and went out and drove it again. And I met that same buddy that I was racing in the parking lot, and, and we rolled down the window, and I was talking to him, and he, he realized that my speech was slurred and everything. He said, are you drunk? And I said, yeah. And he goes, uh, didn't you just wreck that car drunk? And, <laughs> and I said, yeah. And he said, isn't this the first night you've had it back? And I said, yeah. And he goes, are you crazy? <laughs> and I, I, I think I said, yeah. <laughs> and so that's the way my life was. I always felt like, a lot, I guess a lot of people felt like it wasn't my drinking. It was just these crazy circumstances that happened this one. Now, you know, what I'll do is I'll never run these red lights again. And I'll never run into people anymore if I don't run red lights. I can go as fast as I want, but that's the one thing I won't do anymore. And I would just, you know, every time I got in trouble, I would just remove those one little circumstances that I thought caused everything. Um, and, and also, I kept, every time I went down to Myrtle Beach, I'd get arrested. 
And I don't know. <laughs> and I imagine some of y'all have had that experience too. Because they kind of sneak up on you. You know, you're out there and I'm 19 years old and I got this liquor in my cup. And those dudes drive golf carts. And so you can't even see them coming. All of a sudden they're right in front of you. And they ask you what's in the cup, and you just smart off to them, and you're in jail all of a sudden. <laughs> and I'm kind of, I'm, I'm really, among people I don't know especially, kind of really shy and introverted. But when I drink, uh, I'm just kind of like that. And, I, and I'm especially, when, when I was drinking, I was just especially smart with police. I mean, they're the last people you want to be smart with. But I would always be a big man, you know, and run my mouth. And, and that's what I would call him. Oh, you're a real big man, ain't you? Come and stop me from my liquor. Why don't you go pick on somebody that's doing something worse than this? And, and that never works, by the way. <laughs> they never go, oh, yeah, you've got a good point. I think I will go do that. <laughs> <laughs> they always kind of take offense. And I, and I literally got thrown in jail like four summers in a row, like 16, 17, 18, 19 years old, went down to Myrtle Beach and got thrown in jail. And along the same lines of me being this bum that just moves off of everybody, I get my friends to bail me out, specifically my friend Doug, who ran his own carpet cleaning company, who had a little bit of money. He'd always just bail me out. And, um, and I just took advantage of that. And, and, I, and I never could see that I was just being a big bum. I always thought that since, you know, I didn't work because I was rebellious and I didn't want to, you know, listen to what other people told me to do and, and adhere to the rules of society or just crazy, stupid things like that. And, and just the whole time just trying to convince myself that that was the truth when the truth really was I didn't want to take responsibility for anything, especially, you know, money in my pocket. I wanted other, I, I just had some sort of sense of entitlement or something. You know, the people needed to give me some money and let me go blow it on things. Um, and uh, so in, in my life, just got progressively worse that way. Um, and, but when I was 20 years old, I went back to that same Durandex vinyl siding factory. They took me back, and I was working noon to midnight. And, um, and, and, and I started getting that money in my pocket again. And I had a car again and everything. Oh, I meant to tell you before that, before that summer, uh, my dad, he, I didn't have a car before that summer. And I tried to talk him into getting me one. I knew he wanted me to get a job. And I was going to use that as leverage. Dad, if you want me to get a job, you got to get me a car or else I can't get out of there. And he goes, well, I ain't going to get you a car unless you get your hair cut. I had long hair halfway down my back and I had a big old goatee that, um, Big old Fu Manchu, and when it gets real long down here, it turns red on the tips, and uh, and Dad couldn't stand that. Oh, man, that drove him crazy. He was an old military man. Um, <laughs> you know, the only rules he absolutely set down were I couldn't come home with an earring, and I couldn't come home with my hair in a ponytail. Um, but, you know, I kind of compromised with him, and I, and, I, and I cut my hair a little bit, and I saved off my goatee, and he got me a car. And there I was again, just like the summer before that, I was right back on top of the world again. And everything was just going great for me. Um, I had a bunch of money, and um, I had this nice car. It was an 84 Mustang SVO, which I just loved. And uh, and I was going to these, like, parties every night out in the country and stuff, you know, where you drink all that homemade moonshine and all. And um, just and I was just having a blast, and it, and it lasted for about probably, you know, like a month. Um, <laughs> oh. Oh, this was the greatest part, too, is I was dating this girl called, uh, her name was Amanda. And Amanda was a good-looking girl. She really was. She, she had long legs, and she had um, long blonde hair, and she could drink vodka straight out of the bottle. I mean, <laughs> I don't mean just a sip. She'd take like three swallows of it. And I don't think I could never do that. <laughs> So I, I really respected that girl for being able to do that. You know? <laughs> and I knew she was the kind of girl I want to settle. And my parents loved her because, you know, when she was around, she was like the female version of Eddie Haskell. You know, she's around my parents. She was just all sweet and stuff and real nice and had this little uh, baby doll voice and everything. You know, they, and they just loved it and they ate it up. And, and, uh, and we had a great time for a while. But... <laughs> But what happened was, my parents went out of town. That was always a mistake. They went out of town, and uh, and we just and, and I had a bunch of parties at the house, and, and like I always did. And what I would do was, I always had these great plans about, you know, three days before my parents get home, everybody's getting out. I'm cleaning up the house and make sure there's nothing around, you know. And I had three days before they got home would come, and I'd say, well, two days before they get home. <laughs> 
<laughs> and then before you know it, an hour before they were there, I was running around the house trying to pick everything up. And they'd always find stuff. I mean, they found some bad stuff, too. I mean, people would sometimes just kind of be mean. And, uh, like, I had a party at the house, and somebody went and hid, like, a beer bottle in between their bed and the dresser and just stuff like that. You know, people just mess with you. They didn't care. I mean, it wasn't like I wasn't doing that at their parties, too. But, <laughs> but you know, why did they have to do it to me? Um, but anyways, my parents went out of town this time, and they went to Michigan. My, like I said, my mom's got family up there in Canada. And uh, they took my little brother, so I was just all by myself at the house. And I got my friend Jeff to get me a case of beer. And uh, and I was sitting around. I was still 20 years old. I wasn't even old enough to buy it at that time. And um, I was sitting around the house drinking it all day. And that was one of the few times that I didn't pass out after just a couple of hours of drinking. I, I don't know. My body was really never geared for drinking a whole lot. I was just, I, I got to where, especially towards the end, that I would drink. I don't even know how many because I would go into a blackout, say, after six beers and, you know, pass out after 12, and it would happen pretty early, like at 10 o'clock, and, you know, at 10 o'clock at night, and, um, and then I'd wake up the next day and start drinking again, and I'd be passed out before noon, you know, and I'd wake back up at 3 in the afternoon, I'd be passed out again at 7 o'clock at night. I mean, no matter how many times I'd passed out, I guess my brain just never got well rested enough or something. And... Uh, <laughs> Never got, I never gave it ample time to get back on his feet. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and I think that it, when people are older and have a family and all, a lot of times that sort of drinking pattern is really like a shame and people are sad about the devastation it's caused to his family. But when you're in college and doing that, it's funny to people, you know, and they, they like to have fun at your expense, like write cuss words on your face with magic marker, you know, <laughs> or tie your shoelaces together so you can't get up and go to the bathroom in the middle of the night and just things like that. And they would always mess with me because I was always the first one to pass out. My friend Andrew was always bad about putting Tabasco sauce on my lips. Um, <laughs> and, and that wouldn't really, it, you, I wouldn't wake up, it wouldn't be so hot, it's just making me want to puke. <laughs> um, but so I just got tired of people messing with me all the time because I was passed out every night. And they, you know, and they, they, a couple of my friends started calling me alcoholic and then, you know, people making fun of me and they called me the pass out king. And um and and then like after I got tired of everybody messing with me for a couple of years, I finally came up with a plan. And and well, I had two plans. And, and the first plan was uh, the first plan was by this time I was too poor to uh, afford any drugs. I was just uh, buying like these 99 cent malt liquors, like Silver Thunder malt liquor and St. Ives malt liquor and all that stuff, because they just really, really were powerful and they didn't cost very much. Now they, they made me stink really bad. <laughs> I mean, just like everything about me stunk when I drank that malt liquor, but it didn't matter to me. I would just, I just love that cheap stuff. It was just the best. Um, so, and so I didn't have enough money to buy any drugs that would keep me awake. But what I saw at the convenience store was they had them things called, they were like, I think, like them truckers take to drive a long ways. I think they were called mini things or something or caffeine pills of some sort. And I thought, well, shoot, I mean, this is the answer to me passing out all the time. I'll just give me a bunch of these caffeine pills and I can just drink as much as I want to. And right when I'm feeling that passing out coming on, I'll just take a bunch of them caffeine pills and party all night. And so, you know, I put that brand new bottle of pills in my pocket and I went to my first party with my bottle of Evan Williams, and I was just, I wasn't even thinking about how much I was drinking. I was just drinking as fast as I could. And here comes that old familiar feeling, you know, 10 o'clock at night. All of a sudden, I'm oh, getting a little tired, about to pass out. So um, I said, all right, I got it handled. And I went up into the bathroom and opened up them caffeine pills. And I took me like four of them, put it back in my pocket. And uh, as I was walking back down the stairs, I threw up everywhere. And 30 minutes later, I passed out. <laughs> <laughs> And so, and, and uh, you know, and uh, that's not the crazy thing. Taking them caffeine pills ain't the crazy thing. The crazy thing is I tried about six or seven more times just to make sure it didn't work. <laughs> but um, <laughs> eventually I gave up on that too. Um, and so my second thing was, after I did that, just like it's really just like a surrender just to give up on this whole thing, was I would just crawl under coffee tables because the kitchen tables were too high kitchen tables would be like this, and people could still get under there after you, you know, and do things to you. But then, <laughs> but then coffee tables, they're only about this high. And if you can crawl under the one of them, a lot of times you're safe for the whole night. <laughs> and, that, 
And that was a fairly effective thing to do. It really kind of worked. But the only thing was, it earned me another nickname, and people from then on called me Kevin under the table. And that's what they'd always call me, because every night, you'd see me at the party, 10, 11 o'clock at night, caught up under that table, passed out. <laughs> And, and I just went 40 miles to come back to the fact that this one day when my parents were out of town in Michigan, I didn't pass out. And look at, you know, I, later on, I wished I would have. Um, but all my, my friends were over there, and, and just a couple of them that day were over there, and, and I got drunk and was just goofing off and went and my, got my dad's shotgun. And it didn't have any shells in it, but I was just walking around, like, pumping it and clicking it at them and just, like, you know, trying to mess with them. But they didn't think it was too funny. <laughs> <laughs> so they left, and uh, <laughs> and I was there by myself, and uh, and I was like, well, what am I going to do now? I'm drunk, and I, you know, I got nobody here to hang out with me. So something cool happened. That Amanda girl, she was getting off work about three thirty, and this was early afternoon. So she got home at four o'clock, and I called her up and said, hey, let's go get something to eat. She didn't realize I was drunk. She said, all right. So um. I went out there and got her, and I picked her up, and and the, it was raining that day, and the roads were all wet, and I was in that Mustang, and I was flying all over the place with her in the car, and of course, you know, as soon as she got in the car, she realized I was drunk, and she was getting real scared, and telling me to slow down, and I was thinking that was even more funny, you know, that she was really scared, and I was <laughs> messing with her, and um, and, but I stopped at a, at a bank machine to get some money, and when I got back in the car, I put it, that Mustang in reverse, and Rev up the motor and dumped the clutch and started spinning backwards. And she said, Kevin, don't you see those cops over there? And um, and I just turned, and they were just right across the road at the gas station. They were leaning against the car just talking to each other. And the boat just kind of turned her head and looked over at me. And uh, <laughs> and they got in and, and blocked my car in. And this was like 4 o'clock in the afternoon or 4.30 in the afternoon. Oh, and I made the mistake of, um, you know, since I didn't want my parents to find beer around the house and stuff, that I took all the empties and stuck them back in the case and had them in the back seat of my car. <laughs> and I rolled down my window, and I, and I know the alcohol smell came out, and that cop said, it, well, first he said, boy, you got a problem, and then he said, you've been drinking, haven't you? And I said, yeah, a little bit. And, uh, and you know, I really, to this day, I still don't have a clue what happened to Amanda. She, she got home somehow. Maybe the cops took her. Maybe she called somebody. I really don't know, because I was in, in the middle of a, of a kind of semi-blackout. I remember a few things here and there. And one thing I remember was, of course, taking a sobriety test, and um, and he, he made me blow on a portable breathalyzer, and I, I failed it according to him. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'm still saying it's his word against mine. <laughs> um, I was drunk. I was really drunk that day, you know. And and then he got me in the car, and I did the same thing with him that I done with all the other cops. I mean, he he like slowed down the stop sign and kept going. I told him he didn't come to a complete stop and just stuff like that. You know? <laughs> and he took me on in. This was uh, in Denver, North Carolina, and he took me on in. It was in, it's in Lincoln County, and he took me on into the Lincoln County Courthouse and um, sat me down with a breathalyzer. And 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 I tried to take a drink of water before I blew in, and he wouldn't let me do that. And I didn't have a penny in my pocket to put in my mouth to try that one. Um, but I did try something else that my friends told me would work, and that was they told me when I blow into the breathalyzer, blow into it out of one side of my mouth and blow air out the other side of my mouth. And that, then I would pass. But he saw that I was doing that, and he wouldn't turn the machine on while I was doing that. And I did it twice. He said, if you do it again, I'm just going to give you refusing to blow in the breathalyzer. So... You know, I thought, well, I mean, that'll be better than actually blowing on it. Little did I know it was worse, but um, I said, all right, just go ahead and do that. And and, uh, and so he did. <laughs> and they took my license in North Carolina. They took my li- they take it from a year for a year from the date that you fail to blow on it, and then after you go to court, they take it for another year from then. So that was just a mistake. <laughs> and, and I thought I knew all the laws, but you know, all my friends had had DUIs by then, so I thought I knew all the laws, but I didn't know that one. Um, and in and, and my uh, DUI case, and this might have happened to a million people, but I'm the only one I've met so far, and, I, and if you've had this happen to you, please tell me. But uh, my, my dad, we, I, I got found guilty, of course, uh, of the DUI, but we appealed it, um, and appealed it like three times, and my DUI ended up going to a 12-man jury trial. And... Uh, 
which is just ridiculous looking back on it. I, mean. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why. Oh, it was another one of those things. Like I thought I had this out. Like I was, like I talked about before. And uh, my lawyer was saying, well, if he didn't have suspicion that you were drinking and driving, then if he pulls you over for something else, he can't give you a ticket for drinking and driving. Which I think is preposterous, but I'm not sure about that. Because <laughs> they did give me a ticket for drinking and driving, and and. Uh, and they called my dad up to the witness stand, and some of these things I didn't even remember saying, but they had on record. They've asked you this long list of questions when you're in the courthouse, and, um, and I guess I just got tired of them asking me questions um, because they asked me if I had a glass eye, and I said yes, and they asked me if I had false teeth, and I said yes. <laughs> and um, they put during the 12-man jury trial, they put my dad up on the witness stand to testify that I did not have a glass eye or false teeth. <laughs> 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 and that was just really embarrassing. And it caught my lawyer off guard, too. He got up and said that they, that I, I mistook and thought they asked me if I had glassy eyes because I was tired from staying up the night before. Um, <laughs> so the, the guy gets up and says, yeah, he's guilty, he's charged, whatever. And, uh, and after I got that DUI, I did some of my worst drinking. I mean, that wasn't like my bottom. All of a sudden, I, I saw that everything was messed up, and I, you know, and all of a sudden came into AA, and things were good from then on. It was just like, that was just like really the beginning of the worst year of my drinking. I mean, that was really when I started feeling all that suicidal feeling, you know, and just feeling like I just hate everything, and I want to kill myself. And, and, and at school, you know, not when I didn't have a car, I would just convince myself, you know, this I'm going to kill myself today, and I'd be walking back. Uh, from class, you know, feeling so sorry for myself, and people would just go by and throw things at me and yell at me, you know, get a car and stuff like that. <laughs> just not nice, not knowing the shape I was in. Um, and things never got any better. I mean, I'd, I would just, I would just... I was just a mean drunk when I got drunk. At one time, even, I was riding with that same friend, Jason, who had gotten me that job at Narandex Final Siding Factory, and it would help me out on several other instances as well. I was riding with him in his car after I'd lost my license, and it was in the middle of the night. We'd left the bar, and we was coming back home from it, and we met a policeman, and just out of nowhere, I just stick up my middle finger to the policeman. <laughs> and I'm in the passenger side, and he turns around and gives Jason a DUI. Um, and so it's just... You know, I just, just that kind of stuff where I just had no concern for other people's well-being, just completely drunk and completely self-centered and just didn't care about anything. And um, and I think it was just that kind of stuff. Well, what happened in, in the middle of that year or towards the end of that year of my worst drinking, uh, it, it, they told me that in order to eventually get my license back, I'd have to go take an alcohol abuse assessment to see if I had a problem. And I went and took that, and they told me I had a problem. And, um, and they sent me to these classes, these alcohol education classes, like eight of them that I had to go and learn about. You know, they show you a film of a regular liver and an alcoholic liver and that kind of stuff. But they also told me that uh, I had to go to 15 AA meetings. And, you know, it was just really the perfect coincidence that at that time, I mean, I just really felt like that by the end, I hit my bottom and I had just kind of run along it for a while, not knowing what the matter was. Just thinking that I was just messed up in the head and thinking that, you know, the world was out to get me and the same old stuff like a lot of people think and just not knowing what to do. Um, and the, the last night I drank was pretty much like the first night I drank. I went to this party and I uh, got way too drunk and I did a bunch of stupid stuff and I passed out real early. And just like a bunch of other times, I, you know, I woke up like 20 miles from home with no way to get there. And I was just so fed up and just so sick of all that just day after day after day of waking up, getting drunk, blacking out and passing out, causing problems in my own life and everybody else's life, too. So it was just a mess. Um, so I, I went to my first AA meeting, and um, and the day before I went to that AA meeting, I just decided that I wasn't going to drink that day. you know. And I said, well, maybe let me just listen to see what these people have to say anyways. And I went into their, that, to that meeting, and, uh, and that was in Boone, North Carolina. Uh, and the date was October 6, 1993, and I haven't had a drink since. But um, I went in there, and I don't really remember a whole lot about the meeting. I remember a bunch of happy people, you know, laughing and joking around with each other, and, and I thought they must have been sober forever. But, you know, I found out later a couple of them was only sober 30, 60 days and stuff like that. But after the meeting, they uh, gave out the chips. And the guy that was giving them out, and I can't remember whether somebody else got up and got a white chip, and I just saw that everybody was clapping for him and looking at him, and I didn't want to do that, or, or I just didn't know what to do. So I didn't get a white chip when he offered them. But after he uh, offered them, he said, I'm going to leave this white chip up here. If you're too shy to come get it, you can come get it after the meeting. 
And uh, so after the meeting was over, I walked up there and got that white chip from him. And uh, his name was Richard. <laughs> and uh, and I was real paranoid about AA. I thought that AA, once you went to a meeting, if you went to a bar, they just have somebody kind of sitting in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> And as soon as you take that drink, you feel a tap on your shoulder, and the guy goes, you know, we seen you today, yeah, yesterday, what's the deal? <laughs> so I was just real paranoid, and plus I was real nervous, you know, I was in an AA meeting, I was 21 years old, and I was just nervous as I could be about everything. Um, but this Richard guy asked me if I want his phone number, he wants to help me out, so he offers his phone number. But in my paranoia and my nervousness, I thought he was asking for my phone number. And you know how... Um, and how it works, it says, if you have decided that you want what we have and are willing to go to Inlex to get it. Um, well, you know, I kind of, he, he asked that, and I kind of thought he wanted my phone number. I stepped back and said, oh, you want my phone number? And Richard laughed at me and said, no, I don't want nothing you got. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? I, I, I mean, it, it, looking at, it could have been kind of mean, but he, he just said it in such a nice way, in such a laughing way, you know, and just slaps me on the back. And it's really cool about it. And, um, and I did get his phone number. And, and there was a guy standing next to him, and his name was Adam. And Adam uh, introduced himself and said, you know, I'm glad you're here. Keep coming back. And and then on my way out, another guy named Matt stops me. And Matt says, man, you know, I'm glad you're here. Keep coming back. And it's like my old friend Jim G. from Dothan, Alabama said, it, it surprised me because people up until then had always told me to leave and never come back. And now, <laughs> now people are telling me to keep coming back. And it was just kind of cool. Um, and Adam ended up even uh, being my roommate. I started going to meetings a lot. Well, it took me actually about two or three months to start going to a meeting every day. For a while there, I was going to about three or four meetings a week, and I and I was calling my sponsor just kind of you know a couple of days a week and stuff like that. Uh, but so I went home from Christmas break. I got sober in October, and I went home for Christmas break in December. And I was going to be there for like three weeks, and I didn't go to a meeting for like those two or three weeks. Um, and Dad had a Mustang, and I got my license back. And uh, and I went out to to uh, just to, I went to go to the old hangout spot, back to Untouchables Pizza, and I, and I told myself I'm not going to stop in there. I'm just going to drive by and see who's out there. Um, but I drove by and my friend Billy was out there, so I stopped in there, and um, and I said, "What you doing, man?" And he said, "Well, just hanging out." And he says, "Is that a GT Mustang?" And it, it was the '94 model, just when they changed the body style, and it was just good looking car. And uh, he said, "Let's take that thing to Gastonia and get us a drag race." And I said, "All right, let's do it." You know, and I we and, and I had never planned on even stopping in there. And here I was headed off to trouble. And uh, and on the way out, I said, "Well, if Billy wants me to stop and get him. You know, for him to get a six pack, I'm just going to say no." And in order to help myself be so firm, I was repeating that over and over in my head. If Billy said stop, say no. If Billy said stop, say no. And Billy said, "Can I stop and get some beer?" I said, "Sure." And I pulled in there. <laughs> <laughs> so he gets that six pack, and and he drinks it pretty much on the way down there. And we get down there, and he's feeling a little buzz. And this Camaro pulls up beside us, and Billy starts, you know, offering to race him and all. And we kind of go a little bit out of Gastonia, and turn around and stop on the top of the hill and say one, two, three, and we go down that hill, and. uh I, I was probably in third gear, and I saw the headlights coming behind me, and I said, Billy, I'm busted. Here comes a cop. And he said, that ain't a cop. That's just another Mustang wanting to run with you. But I just I just had a feeling. You know, I just knew it was, and it was. It was a policeman. And I lost that race. That was the worst thing about it. <laughs> but he, uh, he hit that blue light, and both of us pulled over. And, you know, that was – I was two months sober – or three months sober, and that was Dad's company car. And that was not only like a drag race, that's what they call premeditated speed competition, which means if you do that, they can take your car. And it was Dad's company. I mean, he could have got fired. And he had like 20-something years with the company. And, I mean, that was like, at that point, my idea of sobriety. And that just goes back to the old saying, you know, you got a drunken horse thief and you take the liquor away from him, you still got a horse thief. And I, I was, you know, just as irresponsible as I ever was, just without the drinking, you know. Just, and it just, <clears throat> after that, it really hit me. It really hit me, kind of what people was talking about, about needing to change everything about my life and not just quitting the drinking. You know, everything's got to change. And I tried to talk my way out of that ticket. I was so scared. That state trooper was in there, and I, and I was in his car, and he said, uh, and, and I started thinking about what I was going to do, what I was going to tell him to try to get out of that. And I said, sir, can I, t can I say something? He said, yeah. And I said, sir, listen, I, I've had a problem with drinking uh, in my life for about the last five years, and um, 
I did the AA about two months ago, and really, you know, I, I've just started to, to do my best to get my life turned around. And he goes, well, it, that's good, son, but this ain't no way to start. And give me a ticket. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so, um, and, 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 I, and I did the same old irresponsible thing with my parents. I had no money. You know, I was always out there taking these risks that I could not ever, what do they call it, right sex with your butt, can't cash. I was always doing that. Always doing that. And I go home, and I'm, before I leave back to school, I write some letter to my parents telling them I got a ticket and would they pay for it. I mean, it's just, it makes me sick to think about it, really, at this point, the way I took advantage of them and the, and the terrible things I did. Um, but when I got back to Boone, I mean, from then on, I really feel like that was the turning point of me taking this program seriously. And when they told me to go to a meeting every day, you know, early on, that's what I, I started going to a meeting every day. I started calling my sponsor every day, and they got, they got me involved in service work, and they got me involved in the steps. And, uh, and I mean, things for me just really from that point on turned around so quickly. I mean, just the physical part, to be able to go to sleep at night without staring at the ceiling and uh, to be able to eat a couple meals a day and to have just a few dollars in my pocket, just that kind of stuff early on was what I was so grateful for. And then so much came on after that, you know, to starting to feel a little emotionally better and be able to look people in the eye and, and, you know, pick up my grades at school. Just in every way, in every single way, my life improved. I mean, it, I really feel like it couldn't have gotten much worse. Uh, well, it could have gotten a lot worse. Don't get me wrong. I mean, there's a lot of stuff I, that could have happened out there. But I, I don't think I could have felt much worse anyways. And, and, and from then on, I mean, things just really got so much better. Um, and then I was up there in school for about a year and a half. And I moved down to North Carolina and uh, started dating this girl. And, and I kind of got away from AA a little bit. I wasn't going to as many meetings and all. And I was going, you know, I started going twice a week and then, you know, once a week and then once every two weeks. And I started getting miserable again. And, and uh, one day I just called up my old sponsor, Dick and Boone, and, and I just told him that, uh, you know, things were bad. And, and I started crying on the phone even, you know, just telling him how bad things were. And I had like a year and a half of sobriety or something at that time. And uh, he just got me back into the basics again, get back to meetings again, get back to making the coffee again. I mean, if things are no different for me or or, or a lot of things are no different for me no matter how long I've been sober than they were when I first got in you know of being back of service to AA and making the coffee and setting up and going to a bunch of meetings and calling my sponsor and things like that and reading a big book just getting back into them basics and about that time I got moved down I got transferred down to Dothan Alabama and uh and 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 from that point on I mean things were really good again uh, they got me back involved. That home group got me involved back in service again and uh, started going to, like the area assemblies and the district meetings and all them kind of things and just had a lot of fun. And my sponsor down there got me going out to meetings all over the place and uh, visiting lots of different home groups in Georgia and in Alabama and Florida and everywhere. And I just had a really great time down there and I learned a lot and, and I miss a lot of that stuff down in, in Alabama. I'm not saying I don't get it here because I do, but I just, you know, I really feel like that was. Um, I don't know, like a turning point in my sobriety when things kind of got back on track again and I started uh, feeling good again. But, you know, the, my life is just great now in, in every way. I, I got married about four months ago to just a beautiful uh, little blonde-headed girl. She's from Latvia, which is like northeast Europe, and um, and, and we get along great. And, uh, and, and my job is going great. I've been transferred with it a couple times. And the cool thing about AA is, I mean, you know, this job transfers me around. But wherever I go, you know, I show up at an AA meeting. There's somebody there with their hand out telling me that they're glad I'm there, just like they were at that very first meeting in Boone, North Carolina. I mean, it doesn't change. I mean, everywhere I go, people are just friendly and open. And I've, and I've been to meetings in lots of different places. And, you know, with few exceptions, it's always that way. And that's just really cool. And it's just because, you know, those people, by giving it away, are able to get something for themselves. And uh, I just love the way the program works in that way. And, you know, one of the best things about uh, my sobriety is that I was able to finally make amends to my dad, you know, and and, uh, and I, I was going to pay him back for all the stuff I had done. My sponsor back in North Carolina had gotten me to do that, you know, and, uh, and he told me to go up and offer the money to my dad. And I said, what if he turns it down? And he said, offer him again. And I said, what if he turns it down again? He said, offer him again. <laughs> And I, and I did. <laughs> and I went up there and offered three times, and Dad told me no, he wouldn't take it. He wouldn't think about it, you know. He just uh, he just told me that he was glad that I was sober and glad that, that, that my life was back together again, and that's all he cared about. And that was just really, really cool. <laughs> Another thing that happened was um, I went, when I was living in South Alabama, I went back to North Carolina. They got this these campgrounds with all these big wooden shacks lined up in a row where everybody goes once a year. It dates back to the 1800s. Um, and uh, I know it sounds really, really country, and it really, really is. <laughs> but I was out there with my old sponsor from North Carolina, and um, 
we were just walking around talking, and coincidentally, the policeman that gave me the DUI was down there. And, uh, you know, I had avoided him, and this was like seven years or, yeah, I think six or seven years after I'd gotten sober. And I had avoided him this whole time, and I'd, you know, whenever I'd see him at this campground place, I'd, you know, kind of off to the other side of the path or just not look at him and avoid him. And I, and I justified this in my head going, well, everybody talks junk to cops, you know. Everybody says mean things to policemen. It's just part of their job. And that's the way I justified not making amends to this guy that I'd said a bunch of bad stuff to when he gave him this DUI. So I started telling my old sponsor this story. And he goes, well, did you ever make amends to him? And I said, no. And he goes, well, now would be a good time. And the guy was right down there, you know, and my sponsor's there. And I'm thinking, oh, yeah, you know, really, he's right. I do need to go do this. And I went down there, and uh, and, I, and, I, and he was eating a hamburger. And I said, sir, can I talk to you for a second? And, uh, and I pulled him aside because he had another policeman there with him. I just wanted to talk to him. And I said, you know, I know you don't remember this, but eight years ago, or however long ago, you gave me a DUI. And what I wanted to tell you was thank you. Um, you know, for saving my life. And I also want to tell you that I really said some bad things to you that day, and I wanted to come and apologize. I had no right to say any of that stuff I said to you. Um, and I know it was eight years ago, and I know you have no idea who I am, but I just needed to come tell you these things. And he kind of looked at me funny for a second and went, Black Mustang. <laughs> and I said, yeah, that was me. <laughs> Um, and that taught me, you know, that it, it taught me a couple things. One thing that people do remember, you know, whether I think they do or not, people do remember some of the things I've done to them. And two, I mean, that was just like this unimaginable burden that was lifted off of my shoulders. And, uh, and, and it just, it taught me that, you know, these amends, as much as I need to apologize to this guy, is also for me, too, to get this guilt out of my mind, to get this weight off my shoulders, um, and, and try to set things right in the best way I can. But, the, the thing with Dad was, the best thing about Dad is Dad, um, about making amends with him, is that he uh, got cancer about, uh, let's see, in 2000, which means I had about seven years sober. So I'd already made amends to him and everything. And, it, and he got um, cancer, and he started getting really, really sick and went through all the chemotherapy. They found it too late, and there was just really not a whole lot they could do for him. And then, so I was up there visiting over Christmas holiday, and he went, him and Mom went to the hospital, and... uh and they came back, and when they came back, I could tell something was wrong. And, uh, and, uh, and Dad sat down on the couch next to him, and he put his arm around me. He said, son, the doctor told me I've got about 30 days to live. Sorry. Um, and then he said, uh, he said, he said, but I just want you to know that you've been a good boy. And I said, well, I don't know about that. <laughs> and he said, I'll never forget this as long as I live. He said, well, everybody's got their little hiccups now and then. <laughs> oh, I put that man through a lot. I mean, through a lot. And I had a hard time, you know, I was angry at a lot of people when I was drinking, and I wouldn't ever let nothing go. And all the things I put that man through, he just forgave me that easy and just caught a little hiccup, said it wasn't nothing to him. You know, and that just teaches me a lesson in life that that I'll just never forget. And, uh, and you know, and y'all gave me that. Y'all gave me the ability not only to get sober, but to set things right with him and with my mom and with my brothers and all, and, and just to kind of get my relationship with them back together again. And, and get the respect back of some people. Um, you know, some things do die hard. I, just trying to catch up with some some old friends from my drinking days, and uh, I called my old friend Doug, the one that used to bail me out of Myrtle Beach Jail. And I, it was just like six months ago that I called him, just to get back in touch with him and just to say hello. And uh, and, I, and I called him up, and, and we talked for about just, you know, ten seconds. And all of a sudden he goes, Kevin, is everything all right? Do you need anything? <laughs> and I said, no, I don't need anything, man. I just called to say hello and just to see how things are going. So, uh, you know, this is a lifelong process. This is a lifelong process for me and, 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 you know, for the people around me, I guess, too. And I just got to take it one day at a time. And, uh, 
And as long as I remember that, you know, to stay sober one day at a time and just you know, put the next foot forward and do the next right thing, whatever I can, and stay involved in AA, most importantly, you know, to stay involved in a home group and to stay active in this thing, then I know that, you know, even though things are going to be up and down and bad things are going to happen, that, you know, it's going to turn out all right. It's just going to, and I really do feel that way because I've had a few, you know, bad things happen to somebody and, and, uh, and, and things just do kind of just turn out all right as long as I don't pick up a drink and as long as I stick around y'all people. And I appreciate y'all being here tonight. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.